Hi guys, this is Miss Romani, and for today's lesson we're going to be learning all about water. It seems that whenever something of importance happens in our world nowadays, Google will commemorate it with a special logo. So it was no surprise that this was the logo in late September of 2015, after NASA made an incredible announcement. Liquid water had been discovered on Mars. This was huge news. Scientists had never found liquid water on a surface beyond Earth. And liquid water meant the possibility of life outside our planet. But why? Well, mostly because life on our planet cannot exist without water. So that's what we're going to focus on today. The properties that make water unique and important for life on Earth. And it cannot be overstated. Nothing on our planet could survive without water. It covers about 70% of the surface, and over 60% of our bodies are pretty much just water molecules. And water truly is a unique substance. Not only does it cover most of the surface of our planet, it is also the only substance on Earth that can occur naturally in all three states, even simultaneously, like on this picture. So what makes this simple molecule of two hydrogen and one oxygen so special? Well, let's recall from the lesson on bonding that water is made up of polar covalent bonds between oxygen and two hydrogen and that water has an asymmetrical shape, which is actually due to a couple of lone electron pairs, which give water a sort of V-shape. So it is the combination of the shape of the water molecule and the unequal distribution of charge that makes the oxygen of the molecule slightly negative and the hydrogen end of the molecule slightly positive. So water's unique properties just boil down to polarity and hydrogen bonding. Pretty much all of the properties of water we will explore in this lesson occur because water is a polar molecule and also because it can hydrogen bond with other polar molecules and with itself. More specifically, each water molecule can actually form four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. One of the cool properties that results from these hydrogen bonds is called cohesion. Cohesion is just basically the attraction of a molecule to other molecules of the same substance. But water in particular has the highest cohesion of any non-metal substance because of its ability to form strong hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. This cohesion can be seen when you look at a drop of water. You can see how the water molecules are sort of sticking together. Try this at home. Fill up a glass of water and then keep adding more water to the glass until the water level surpasses that of the glass that's holding it in. You will notice that the water will hold on to itself and will not spill out of the glass. This is cohesion at work. Well, cohesion and something called surface tension. Surface tension could be defined as the property of the surface of a liquid that allows it to resist an external force, in this case gravity, due to the cohesive nature of the water molecule. Without gravity, then cohesion and surface tension can actually do some pretty neat things. One of my favorite things about the current space program is when the astronauts on the space station send videos back to Earth demonstrating some of the cool things that can be observed without gravity. And the powerful cohesion and surface tension of water become very apparent when gravity is removed. So here you can see astronaut Scott Kelly playing with a drop of water as if it were a ping pong ball. Or in this video, where Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield demonstrates a challenge when wringing out a wet towel in space. Notice how the water molecules are sticking to each other and make it very, very difficult to remove the water from the towel. And so is this high surface tension of water that allows some insects to essentially walk on water. Surface tension due to hydrogen bonding creates a thin film on the surface of the water that gives enough resistance for these insects and at least one species of lizard to walk on. And of course, water doesn't just stick to other water molecules. It can also stick to other surfaces. Take this spider's web or this stem, for example. Once again, the polar nature of water allows for the ability of water to not just hydrogen bond, but to also form any type of dipole-to-dipole -dipole attraction to other polar substances. This property of water is called adhesion. So adhesion and cohesion are similar properties of water, and they often occur simultaneously when water is found in a polar container or on a polar surface. 
Adhesion along with cohesion is responsible for a property of water called capillary action. This refers to water's ability to defy gravity and climb up a narrow tube. Thanks to adhesion, the water molecules are attracted to the molecules in the tube. But as the water molecules adhere to the tube, other water molecules are drawn in by cohesion, following those fellow water molecules. The surface tension created causes the water to climb up the tube, and it will continue to climb until eventually gravity, pulling down on the weight of the water, overpowers the surface tension. So the narrower the tube, the further up the water can climb. And that is because the smaller diameter tubes have more relative surface area inside the tube, which allows capillary action to pull the water up higher than in the larger diameter tubes. And capillary action is not just about tubes. Water climbing up any polar surface is an example of capillary action. So the next time you clean up a spill with a paper towel, pay attention and see if you can witness capillary action at work. Or at the very least, just clean up the spill. Can't hurt to help out. So adhesion and cohesion work together to keep water moving up the narrow xylem tubes inside plants. Have you ever wondered how water can move from the soil up to the leaves of a very tall tree? I mean, you probably know that trees can absorb water, but how do they do that? Especially when that water has to move extremely large distances against gravity. This is where adhesion cohesion, and capillary action play a role. Adhesion causes the water molecules to cling to the inside of the xylem tubes through which they are traveling. At the same time, cohesion between the water molecules causes a long unbroken chain of water to form inside the xylem. So both adhesion and cohesion then produce capillary action and move the water up the xylem. But none of these activities would be able to move water so high up a tree if the movement wasn't also aided by a process called transpiration. Transpiration is basically evaporation of water from the leaves of a tree into the air. Basically tree sweat. You may think that most of the water that a tree absorbs will be used by the tree to survive or for photosynthesis, but you'd be wrong. Transpiration rates may vary between species or depending on the time of day or the temperature, but in general, trees transpire way more water than they use. So what happens is that the leaf pores where water evaporates, the evaporating water is pulling the chain of water molecules out of the xylem. And cohesion between water molecules means that the chain of water molecules will be pulling new water molecules all the way down at the roots. So that's how trees can move water from the roots all the way to the top of a leaf. And this is a great example of how without the properties of water, life on Earth could not exist. Trees and other plants are, after all, one of the main producers of nutrients and oxygen on Earth. The next unique property of water we will explore is density. And this can be summarized with a couple of words. Ice floats. You're probably very much aware that ice floats. But if you take a moment to think about it, Ice shouldn't float, at least not in a glass of liquid water. Ice is peculiar for a solid because it is less dense than its liquid form. In grade 9 science, and probably sometime in elementary school, you learn that matter is made of particles, and that in solids, these particles have the least energy and gather close together, and that the energy and distance between particles increases as a solid becomes a liquid, and then a gas. So this means that solid water should be more dense than liquid water and should therefore sink in a container of liquid water. So why does ice float? It's all about hydrogen bonding. Ice is less dense than water because when the liquid cools down and molecules lose energy, more hydrogen bonds form between the molecules, forcing the molecules into a more spread out lattice to accommodate for the maximum amount of hydrogen bonds. In liquid water, the hydrogen bonds break and reform as the water molecules move around. Once the ice forms, the hydrogen bonds are more stable and stay in place, which then cause the molecules to spread out a bit more uh, and take up more space than they did in a liquid. Now it turns out that even though ice is less dense than liquid water, this unique 
density only applies really to the solid form of water, so just to ice. Warm water is, as you would expect, less dense than cold water. Um, water is actually at its most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. Here's the thing. The density of ice means that even when it's really cold, natural bodies of water like a large lake or a pond or an ocean will freeze from the top down. If frozen water was denser than its liquid form, that would mean that ice would sink. Ponds and lakes and oceans would freeze from the bottom up, killing any life within it. As it is, when ice floats, it insulates the water below the surface, preventing lakes and oceans from fully freezing solid, and protecting the aquatic life that can survive right under the ice, like this little fish right here. So this property of water keeps aquatic life from dying in the winter and might have prevented aquatic organisms from going extinct in the past. So it is important to life. Now let's talk about a different property of water. Have you ever gone to the beach on a hot summer day? And if you did, maybe you got really excited to be there and took off your shoes right away, only to discover that the sand was burning hot. However, if you ran to the water, you could cool off your feet. But why is that? Both the sand and the water are in the same beach, on the same hot day, under the same intense solar heat. Why did the sand get so hot while the water remained cold? And why, if you were to return to that same beach at night, you would find the sand to be cold and the water to be relatively warm in comparison? The answers to these questions have to do with the specific heat capacity of water in comparison to other substances. Heat capacity refers to how much heat needs to be added to a substance in order to raise its temperature. And water has a high specific heat. It is higher than most substances and the, and the highest of any liquid. And of course it is higher than the specific heat capacity of sand which is made of the same material as glass, so it's the same as the heat capacity of glass. So what that means is that in order for the temperature of the water in a lake or ocean to increase, it needs to absorb a lot of energy. And similarly, water will hold on to that energy much longer and will not get colder until large amounts of energy are released. The same is not true of many other materials, especially metals. Um, they get hot super fast because they don't need to absorb that much energy to increase their temperature. So what causes water to have such a high specific heat capacity then? Hydrogen bonding, of course. Water's high specific heat capacity is actually caused by hydrogen bonding between water molecules. When water absorbs heat, the hydrogen bonds between molecules are broken and that allows water to move freely but it takes heat or energy that gets absorbed by those, water, those hydrogen bonds for the bonds to be broken. When the temperature of water decreases, on the other hand, the hydrogen bonds are formed and release a considerable amount of energy when they do so. So water can absorb a large amount of heat without changing its temperature very much. And this allows the oceans that happen to cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface to absorb excess heat and moderate the planet's temperature, keeping the planet at just the right temperature for life to exist. In a smaller scale, the water in our blood helps us regulate our body temperature. And a related property is the specific heat of vaporization of water, which basically means that because of the energy required to break hydrogen bonds, it takes a lot of energy to change water from a liquid to a gas. This cool property of water, pun intended, is what allows us to cool down when we sweat. When we sweat, the heat from our skin is absorbed by the water molecules on the skin and is used to break the hydrogen bonds as the water molecules evaporate away. The water molecules that escape away as a gas take the energy with them, cooling off our bodies and keeping us alive in the heat. And finally, Let's talk about water's ability to dissolve things. Water is a good solvent. So good that I actually named this lesson, Water, Life's Solvent. So you know what? No, 
Water is not a good solvent. Water is a great solvent. It is often called the universal solvent because there is no better solvent on earth than water. What makes water such a great solvent? Well, unsurprisingly, it's the polar nature of water and its ability to attract other polar and charged substances. And because living things are made mostly of water, this universal solvent is able to dissolve most nutrients, gases, uh, hormones, proteins, and other important molecules in living cells. So, water is important for life on Earth because it is such a great solvent. Now, as much as water is called Earth's universal solvent, I want to make one thing clear. We need to understand that this doesn't mean that it can dissolve every substance. Water can only dissolve polar or charged substances. Non-polar molecules like fats or oils are not dissolved in water. And as you may recall, we call substances that can be dissolved in water hydrophilic and substances that cannot be dissolved in water hydrophobic. So I hope that after today's lesson you can appreciate water a little bit more than you did before. It really is an amazing substance without which life on earth as we know it cannot possibly exist. And that's it for this lesson. Don't forget to complete your lesson quiz and I will talk to you soon.